When Philip joined himself at the direction of God to the Ethiopian eunuch, as the eunuch was journeying back from his worship of God, as the only way he knew how, by the law of Moses, to Ethiopia, he came into the way of Gaza, roughly the same area in which all that trouble's going on over there today. God, in his direction, had had Philip leave Samaria, brought him down to that area, and linked them up together. There's a great lesson even in that. But Philip heard him reading from the Old Testament specifically, Isaiah 53. And he joined himself under the direction of God to the chariot and asked the eunuch if he understood what he was reading. And he mentioned, uh, well, who is the prophet speaking of, of himself or some other man? And when he joined himself to the chariot, he began at the same scripture where the eunuch was reading, and the scripture simply says he preached unto him Jesus. Now, there's a lot in that. He didn't just stand there and say, Jesus, 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 Jesus. That in grammar is called a synecdoche, where a part either stands for the whole thing or the whole thing for a part. And to preach Jesus is the preaching of the gospel of Christ, God's power to save us from sin, Romans 1.16 which we, the church, are expected to preach wherever we go, Mark 16 and 15. That's the Great Commission. But yet Christ, because he is the center of all things pertaining to the New Testament system of salvation, then to say that you preach Christ is the same thing as saying that you preach all that pertains to who he is and how he saves a man from sin. It even has to do with teaching a man what sin is. And I suggest today that a great many people have no idea what sin is. So if we're thinking about is the church to teach the gospel to people to save them, we may have to explain what does it save them from? Because they have no concept, really, at least properly so, many people, of sin. Remember, a lot of people that call God their Father, the Bible, the Word of God, and Christ their Savior, think they were born into sin, having inherited it, the original sin from Adam. The Bible teaches no such thing. People grow to a point where they're accountable to God for their actions, and they commit sin, which the Bible plainly says is the transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4. Ezekiel said, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And thus Romans 3, 23 places all men under the condemnation of God because of sin. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. But one thing is so true concerning preaching the gospel, the glad tidings, the good news of Christ. That is, we must know that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is God in the flesh. He is the Son of God. He's not just a great teacher among a lot of other teachers. He is the Son of God. When Peter, or rather when Paul was writing to Timothy, he had this to say at the end of the, coming toward the end of the first letter to Timothy. In verse 12, I'll read several verses here. 1 Timothy 6, 12. He tells Timothy, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and has professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth, which means to make alive all things, 
and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now look how he's described. Which in his times he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Now, if that disposition of mine has not been formed in a person concerning Jesus Christ of Nazareth, they don't really have the view that they are expected to have and must have to be saved by Him. Because we've been exposed, many of us, not all, but many, to a lot of teaching from the Bible concerning God and Christ, the Holy Spirit, and the inspiration of the Scriptures, it's easy to forget that a lot of people don't understand Christ in that way. In a world that's going more and more secular, then they deny the existence of anything that's metaphysical or spiritual. The existence of God, thus they would deny the deity of Christ, the existence of the Holy Spirit, the plenary verbal inspiration of the Bible, which means Every word and all of it's inspired of God, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. We above all people need to know that when you preach Christ, you preach the deity of Christ. Now all four books, the first four books of the New Testament, comprise one singular testimony of the historical fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now those of you who've heard me preach for some time know that I've pointed out that about the strongest argument for proving anything the Bible says is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ was raised from the dead to die no more as the Bible teaches, then everything else the Bible says about the existence of God and about the very nature of God, His attributes, and about Jesus, and about Christianity, and so on, is true. So we talk about a historical fact. That does set Christianity apart from all other religions. It is something that can be looked at down through time by the facts that have come to us in such books as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. People say, yeah, but that's the Bible. You can't depend on it. Why? I don't know of any scholars today, even those that deny the deity of Christ, that do not say that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are books of antiquity as much as any other book that you read of about secular matters that have come down to us from that time and even earlier. That being the case, then just simply looking at things as a historian, I must see the multiplied evidence in historical fact, things that happened in past time and space. So the resurrection of Christ implies the deity of Christ. We ought to emphasize more in our teaching facts. All the pertinent facts dealing with a certain subject come together to make the truth about that subject. Truth is objective and absolute. It doesn't make any difference whether you're male or female. And that, uh, of course, are the only two classes of humanity, regardless of what anybody else in their delusion think. And in some way or the other, they are deluded to think otherwise, self-inflicted or whatever. 
He made them, the Bible says, male and female. Or whether you're old or young, rich or poor, whatever ethnic background, we must establish in the minds of all people as we teach the gospel, seeking to see them forgiven of sins and become Christians, the deity of Jesus Christ. So the proof of the entire Christian religion rests upon this historical, something that actually took place place in past time and space event. Now here's what the inspired apostle Paul wrote. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain. And vain means pointless. There's no good in it. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God. Because we, meaning the apostles, have testified of God that he raised him, Christ, from the dead. Whom he raised not up. If so be that the dead rise not. 1 Corinthians 15, 14, and 15. That's a very important statement. But in writing to the church at Corinth, notice how he begins chapter 15. Sometimes we might not realize this. But as he continues on, he says, Moreover, in other words, added to what I just said, Brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. By which also ye are saved. Conditional though, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. That does tell us our belief can become vain. I would say James and James 2 would tell us about at least one way that faith in Christ becomes vain, it's when we won't obey what Christ says. He says, For I delivered unto you, now watch how this goes here. First of all, that which I also received. This had been around a while before Saul of Tarsus was converted. How that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto the present. But some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James and of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. Now, let's pause right there. You go into a town where nobody believes in Jesus Christ as a son of God. What are you going to do? How do you get off the ground and converting people to Christ. Well, it may be that you have to offer proofs of the existence of God. You can find that in the book of Acts a couple of times where they had to do that. But you'll notice in the process, such as in Acts 17, in Athens, as they preach things that prove the existence of God, that in the very process, they almost in one breath preach the resurrected Christ. You'll notice also that witnesses are mentioned here. You brethren at Corinth, you know what I preached unto you when I first came that caused you to be converted to Christ, to become Christians, members of the Lord's church. And now you could even go and verify what I said because there's still people alive who saw him even as I saw him. And he mentions even 500 brethren, the greater part remain unto the present, but some fall asleep, which is another way of saying they've died. One of the things that stands out, as I said, all this took place in past time and space, in actual history. 
One of the things, a great thing that stands out about Christianity is that there were, was much time that went by after the resurrection of Christ where if he had not been raised, there are plenty of people to say, no, he wasn't raised. We can take you to his sepulcher and show you where he is. Nobody could do that. The very first thing after his resurrection that the unbelieving Jews did to try to play it all down, discredit it, was to tell people to say his disciples came by night and stole him away. Now that's interesting because they did not try to say his body's in that tomb, let's go show you. The very effort they had of discrediting him was to say he's not there. Well, that's what the apostles said. All of this wasn't done, in other words, in a corner where only a very, very, very few knew about it. That's what Paul's saying here. This recitation, if you would call it that, that Paul gives, is something that evidently early on had developed very, very early in the church that they could recite concerning the gospel and the rudiments of it. Notice how it goes. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Y'all almost can make a song out of it. And he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fall asleep, and he goes on. This was their effort to say, credible witnesses have given testimony to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, in 1 Corinthians 15, 14, and 15, as we just read a moment ago, Paul plainly and boldly affirms that the apostles of Christ had seen the risen Lord. What are you to do about that? Well, that's 2,000 years ago. So, how's that changed the truth? I've lived long enough to where I can talk about things that happened in the 1960s, experienced them, watched them as they happened. But to some here, some of the younger ones, how do you know I'm telling you the truth? Well, what about World War II? World War I. What about the Great Depression sandwiched between the two? What about the Spanish-American War? What about all of the winning of the West between basically the Civil War and 1890 when they declared the frontier closed? And even earlier than that, and the Civil War itself. How far must we go back? Get a long way away from the time George Washington lived. Did he live? What about if you go back to the time of the pilgrims, the Puritans who came to this country? Did they? Or is that some manufactured thing? Or you go all the way back to the time of the kings and queens of England like Elizabeth I or before that her sister Mary and then her brother before that and then Henry VIII Arthur didn't live very long by the way between the time Henry VIII died and Mary came on the scene but I talk, you see how I talk about them I talk about them as actual facts people who lived on the earth even as we do. How can I do that? How can we talk about the Battle of Gettysburg? How can we talk about anything in past time and space except that we have evidence and we have credible witnesses? I just finished this past week the book by Mary Chestnut who is one of the foremost authorities because it was a diary she kept all the way through the Civil War. And she happened to be one of the aristocratic planters' wives who knew all of the big shots in the Confederacy and 
Very interesting to read. That's called a primary source. I'm getting about as close to it as I can get when I read what she wrote as she experienced it and speaks of people and persons and how they did and what they did and interesting comments, how they looked, etc. It's what you want to do. Question. When you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John concerning Jesus, do you not get the same thing? And when you see John writing 1 John, and we've read it recently, I saw him, I heard him, and I touched him. Now, are we going to stand here and say today, it's all a big lie, falsehood, they manufactured it. Well, the testimony of the apostles, whether written or spoken, is there, as we would say today, eyewitness account of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Luke wrote it this way. With great power gave the apostles their witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them. Acts 4 and verse 33. Now one thing they did that's very important to understand. And we've mentioned this a number of times. You can't study the book of Acts and not study it. Jesus had told the apostles, the Holy Spirit will give his witness and you will also give your witness because you have been with me. That's what a witness must be able to do is give what we say eyewitness testimony. But how then did the Holy Spirit do it? By miracles, signs, and wonders. So the Lord just didn't say, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. There's no evidence I can offer you, but accept it anyway. He didn't do that. He never has. As one sermon that Paul preached says in Acts, he's not left himself without witness. Thus we can prove all things and hold fast that which is good, which we're told to do. First Thessalonians 5.21, he couldn't tell us to do it if there wasn't a way to do it. It's obvious that the New Testament's concept of a witness is one who had seen the risen Lord, since we're talking about the resurrected Christ. In fact, this was the qualification laid down by Peter as prerequisite to being a witness of the Christ. Acts 1, verses 21 and 22. So when Jesus prayed in John chapter 17, and verse 20, for those who would believe on him through, speaking of the apostles, their word. He knew that faith in Christ would come through the oral or written testimony, words if you please, of the apostles of Christ. So we find Paul writing, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now since the death of the last apostle, God communicated that apostolic testimony to every succeeding generation by means of the written word. Thus, as we will study on Wednesday night later on, the Lord willing, but we'll quote it now because we know it so well and it fits here so well. Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ. Why do you have all these words? Because they convey ideas. And when the apostles wanted to give their testimony, they chose words that their testimony could be given with. And that's what it comes down to. And remember, after Thomas had seen the risen Lord, he saw the evidence. He confessed, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus said to him, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they who have not seen and yet have believed. 
John 20, 28, and 29. This comment comes down to us today and will be here until the end of time. And it's the truth because of credible evidence, credible witnesses. So faith trusts confidence in Christ to be the Son of God, the one who gives salvation and the only one who can, is not some sort of blind leap in the dark, which many people today still try to describe it as. It's based on credible witnesses. Now, therefore, if there's an attack to be made at all here by the infidel, it's to attack the credibility of these witnesses. I don't mind telling them, attack away. Prove they're not credible. Three factors combine to make the apostles' testimony believable. They are, number one, the number of witnesses. Number two, the unity of their teaching or doctrine. And number three, their faithful lives under severe persecution, even bringing about death. Look at their number first. Do you realize that one person of reliable character, underscore reliable character, is usually sufficient to confirm the claim or character of another Acts 9, verse 27. Listen. But Barnabas took him, that's Paul, and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in his name. That satisfied the apostles under one credible witness but now in the case of the testimony of Christ's resurrection from the dead there were 12 witnesses besides all these others we see Paul was able to bring up to say well they're there to tell you whether we're telling the truth or not you see this testimony that Jesus Christ of Nazareth rose from the dead was not off out here by itself somewhere it, was in, it went through what one fellow's called the acid test. When they stood up to preach in Jerusalem and to tell the people that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Messiah, you put him to death, but God is raised him from the dead, there are all sorts of people that could have said, that's not true. Let's go to the grave and we'll show you he's still there. But they couldn't do that, could they? They, these witnesses, these apostles, reliability has been confirmed by their lives in hardship and that hardship came upon them due precisely to their testimony. What testimony? That Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. He was put to death, but he was raised from the dead by God. His truth is the gospel. It's the only way to salvation by believing and obeying it. Then there's the historical accuracy of their writings. Try to find something wrong historically with their writings. People have tried in the book of Acts. That is a very interesting study. Now, if these 12 would not be received as a confirmation of the resurrection claim, neither would 1,200 or 12,000 or 120,000, or 500,000, or a million. And on and on you could go. Then the next point was their unity. Unity of agreement among the total number of witnesses lends a great deal of credibility to a claim, regardless of the extremities to which the claim may reach. If you ever get in a court case or you ever watch a court case, you'll see that's exactly what's going on. Witnesses for the prosecution, they say he did it. Here's the witnesses that prove it. But then in cross-examination, sometimes they show they're not what they claim to be. They really couldn't. And the gospel, starting from the very beginning, is placed in a position to be examined in that way. In the case of the resurrection of Christ, the witnesses observed Christ for some three years. 
prior to his crucifixion. And for 40 days following his death and burial, John 20, 26 through 28. Then notice again, as I've said earlier, in 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, John declares years later, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, and have handled of the word of life. He says, we declare to you. Now, many years had passed before John wrote this in 1 John. And yet all of the trouble that had come upon him, had it changed his mind? People don't knowingly uphold a lie when they know it's a lie. They may uphold a lie thinking it's the truth. But they don't die or they persecute it severely for a lie when they know it's a lie and they've been putting it forth as a lie. From Pentecost, Acts 2, until the death of the last apostle, they maintained the story, their story, their declarations about the resurrection of Christ in total agreement with each other. Now, in addition, the interpretation of Old Testament prophecy, their doctrine of man's salvation, man's duty to God and God's part in it, re regarding the church that Jesus built, Matthew 16, 18, Acts 2, that he purchased with his blood, Acts 20, verse 28, in its organization, its purpose, its work, and its worship. Everything they wrote is in perfect harmony with each other in the New Testament writings. By the way, that's one reason that when you have so many different denominations existing, even denying the church has anything to do with man's salvation, and yet you read your Bible and it speaks to the contrary, you know they're not following the Bible. Then it's their lives under persecution. They were a unified band of fearless men who maintained they had walked with Christ. You know, imprisonment didn't alter their position. Acts 4, verses 1 through 3. And to look at an example of that, look at verse 20 of Acts 4. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. In Acts 4, 17 through 21, there's an account of them being threatened with the loss of their lives. But their message didn't change. And the actual death of the Apostle James didn't stop their message at all, Acts 12, 1 through 3. Sometimes we forget about the, mere, the, the, the humanity of these people. James is the brother of John. When you read the book of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Revelation, that's his brother that died right there in the beginning, by the sword, Herod did it. But you don't see that affecting John's declaration of what he knew to be the truth because he experienced it. He must have had the same heartaches and losing his brothers. Anybody would. Same fear, same situation, but he didn't cease what he knew to be the truth. Now, is it reasonable to believe that such men would endure such privation? and hardship to invent and uphold such a lie if it were a lie. The purpose of the apostles' testimony is very interesting. It simply was to confirm the historical fact of the resurrection, which is the ground of our faith, John eleven twenty five. You find this statement in that passage. Jesus speaking as John by inspiration records it. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Then you turn to the epistle of Romans written by the inspired apostle Paul, Romans 1.4. And you find that Christ was declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. And look at what all Paul went through because of that message. 
Just read the book of Acts. Acts 2, Acts 3, Acts 4, Acts 5. It's filled with material showing how they suffered, but they would not quit teaching it. This was adequate to convict and convert hundreds of thousands who had never seen the Christ with their eyes. That word just is powerful today. We need to preach it. We need to believe it will do what God said it would do in the honest hearts of men and women, boys and girls, Luke 8, 15. So what do we conclude? Well, the only conclusion in the light of the evidence is what the apostles declared actually happened. We need to fortify our faith by believing the testimony of these credible witnesses ourselves and then proclaim the word that came from them that is the evidence that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was raised from the dead to die no more and all the other things that are important to connect with it. You see, these things are simple and plain. But maybe because we live in such a secular and technological advanced age that we think they just won't work. Well, look, if you don't want to believe them and you're an honest-hearted person, give me an adequate reason that you won't believe them. I'm not interested in some sort of emotional whatever it is. I want to know why John's a liar. Why Matthew's a liar and Mark's a liar. I want evidence to be produced that is credible, by the way, and adequate. That these men lied through their teeth. Because if they didn't, there's only one other alternative. They told the truth. Jesus Christ of Nazareth He's the only begotten Son of God. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes of the Father but by Him, John 14, 6. I doubt many people will attempt to do that kind of thing because they have too many other ways to try to dodge. And they're not too apt to put themselves in a position to where they can be tried on for size. And I guarantee you, found warning when it comes to the balances regarding the truth. If you're not a child of God, surely you recognize then that you must believe that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, that you must obey the truth when it says you must repent of sins, Acts 17, 30, confess your faith in Christ, John 8, 24, and be baptized into Christ to obtain the remission of your sins, Acts 2, 38. The Lord will, in your doing that, add you to His church. And in that church, you'll be faithful to Him, and heaven will be your home. But know this, the reasons for being a Christian are solid, sound, and cannot be shaken. If you're a child of God and you've erred, we urge you to repent of those sins and pray God for forgiveness. You're subject then to the Lord's invitation. We invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.